this week on Waterways. Life in the Mangroves. amid shifting tides through a meandering path of prop roots, a winding labyrinth inviting childlike excitement as the twists and turns of the waterway wind through an otherwise inaccessible island. A mangrove forest is the pinnacle of natural, pretty places in South Florida, fringing the coastline and blanketing the offshore islands. The beauty is reason enough to admire these structural marvels, but when taking a closer look, under the surface and in the canopy, the importance of these mangrove ecosystems to the overall health of the environment is revealed. Mangroves are interconnected with our most cherished places, seagrass meadows, offshore coral reefs, and our coastal homes and businesses. The word mangrove refers to a group of trees and shrubs that have adaptations for surviving in salty environments. Some mangroves block absorption of salt at their roots. Others secrete excess salt through their leaves. Both techniques for surviving in salty environments enable mangroves to thrive where other vegetation cannot. There are a couple other characteristics that all species of mangrove trees have in common. A tolerance for being submerged in water and adaptations such as breathing roots to survive in low oxygen conditions. Mangroves live in tropical and subtropical climates and within the continental United States can be found in Texas, Louisiana, and Florida. There are 35 true mangrove species worldwide. In Florida, the three main species are red mangrove, black mangrove, and white mangrove. In addition, there are over 80 different types of trees and shrubs considered to be mangrove associates because they are commonly found in mangrove forests. For example, the buttonwood tree is a common South Florida mangrove associate found at the upper margins of mangrove forests. Okay, so here we have a black mangrove, very large specimen. And if we look at the leaves here, um, a lot of times we'll get a little bit of salt on the leaves that forms, that crystallizes onto the leaves. Kind of a dark, darkish leaf, and then with the dark bark, hence the name black mangrove. And then to the left here, we have a very large white mangrove. And you can see by the, the speckled um, bark that it's, that it's a white mangrove. And also, if you look at the leaves here, they're sort of a rounded, um, leaf on the, the white mangrove so you can tell the difference from the leaves. The red mangrove is the most visible and are found on the outermost watery edges of mangrove islands and along many shorelines. Black and white mangroves, as well as the buttonwood, are typically found growing further inland from shore. On the banks of this, of this creek are mangrove, is a mangrove forest and what we see here are mostly pneumatophores of the black mangrove. These are these long finger-like projections out of the sediment. The tree with the dark bark, with the uh, dark checkered bark is the black mangrove. And then within those pneumatophores are red mangrove seedlings. And they will eventually grow and form the canopy here. And then they'll eventually send down prop roots like these. So they call it the walking tree because it's sending out these new, new roots and then moving into new areas. The red mangrove is also called the land builder because it is the first mangrove to colonize new marine and estuarine habitats. When a red mangrove seedling, known as a propagule and resembling a large green bean, drops from the tree, it can float in the ocean currents for up to a year before attaching to substrate. This propagation technique is like a dandelion seed scattered to the wind affording the species a better chance at successful, widespread dispersal. It's incredible. Uh, as we know, these trees, uh, at least the red mangroves, uh, are in the salt water. Uh, the roots uh, 
are inundated all the time. Uh, further back within some of these uh, mangrove islands uh, where the elevation may be just a little higher is the black mangrove and uh, they have lenticels that stick up out of the ground, uh, breathing tubes and uh, beautiful, beautiful trees. Uh, bark is just amazing. But the red mangrove is just, it's unlike any tree that, uh, that I know of in the world. It's, uh, it's literally the only tree that can grow in the conditions that we have uh, uh, throughout the backcountry. Year round, leaves fall into the waters below and are broken up by the actions of yeasts, fungi, and microorganisms. The resulting organic particles are called detritus, an energy-rich base of marine food chains. Consumers of this detritus include filter feeders such as sponges and oysters. The dissolved organics also feed microorganisms, which are food for juvenile fish, pink shrimp, and the Florida spiny lobster all commercially important species, and approximately 75% of commercially caught local fish utilize mangrove habitat at some point during their lifetime. Where we're sitting right now, what goes on under the water is much more significant than what goes on above the water at this point. Um, in this particular creek, you would find uh, any variety of uh, species of fish, including uh, reef fish uh, from our nearby coral reef. Um, but that's where most of the habitat provided by mangroves is essential. It's um, a place for juvenile fish to grow up, uh, again, in a largely, I'm not going to say predator-free because it's not, but they have they can get into the prop roots and escape predators. Marine life found in the mangrove roots is an eclectic mix of shapes and sizes, with some species seemingly not of this world. The sea cucumber looks like a cucumber, of course, but is a living animal. This seafloor scavenger has very peculiar defense mechanisms. If threatened, they can discharge a sticky thread to tie up their rival, or if the thread is more dire, they can expel internal organs from their anus, feeding the predator, but allowing their escape. The internal organs are soon regenerated. Also commonly found in mangrove habitat is the upside-down jellyfish, or Cassiopeia. Pulsating rhythmically and seemingly unfettered by intrusion, most jellies feed by stinging their prey, but these animals position themselves upside down so that the symbiotic algae that lives within their bodies and tentacles can receive sunlight. Food created by the algae is used by the Cassiopeia to thrive in the muddy shallows around mangrove forests. And their ceaseless pulsing creates a current bringing oxygen and additional food. The prehistoric looking horseshoe crab has six pairs of legs for walking, swimming, and moving food into the mouth, which is located in the center of the legs. Horseshoe crabs are often found on the sandy or muddy bottoms, scouring for mollusks, crustaceans, or an occasional small fish. Protected by a hard shell, these marine anthropods are more closely related to spiders rather than crabs, and their blood has unusual properties that helps keep them free of bacterial infections and is used in medicine for the same purpose. Mangrove snapper are native to the Western Atlantic. They are often spotted in mangrove-lined shores, seagrass flats, and even the open water. But as their name implies, they are most commonly found in mangroves, particularly the juveniles. The mangrove snapper is also called gray snapper because of its coloration and is recognized by its eye stripe. It is fortunately one species of snapper that is faring well and does not seem to be overfished. In addition to fish and marine invertebrates, there are numerous species of insects, reptiles, amphibians, and mammals that inhabit mangrove forests. And birds. Mangroves are prime habitat for resident fowl, frigates, pelicans, cormorants, egrets, herons, white-crowned pigeons, ibis, wood storks, spoonbills. Mangrove islands are also an important staging site for birds migrating along the coast. Mangroves provide um, 
wintering habitat for many of the migratory species. When we were coming in, like, we just ran across a, uh, a kingfisher, and I could hear uh, off in the, in the mangroves uh, some of the warbler species uh, singing. Um, so this, especially on a day like today where it's so windy, this habitat uh, provides wind cover. Um, there's abundant food resources for insect-eating birds. Um, and of course, fish eating birds. Uh, for many of our resident species, uh, wading birds, cormorants, pelicans, um, it provides nesting habitat. Um, these islands are isolated in such a way that it's kind of a predator free environment. So things that feed on eggs and chicks like raccoons or bobcats or possum um, can't get here. For many years, Dr. Jerry Lorenz has monitored wading bird and spoonbill nesting populations in Florida Bay. While there have been some positive signs of species recovery, there has also undoubtedly been a negative impact on nesting success because of increased boat traffic. Florida has more registered recreational watercraft than any other state. And since the early 1990s, boat registration in Florida has more than doubled. Tom Wilmers of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has seen boat traffic greatly increase in the 28 years he has been visiting these mangrove islands. Today, he is checking some roosting islands in the Gulf of Mexico, north of Big Pine Key. We're going to visit, uh, from a respectful distance, some uh, magnificent frigate bird roost. And there's, uh, there's 17 of them that I know of. Uh, some are very small, uh, less than 25 birds. Uh, some have typically more than 250 and, and swell to over 700 uh, uh, at the end of the season. Uh, when I say the end of the season, uh, I, I mean mid-November, uh, one of the colonies uh, roost this year had over 700 birds on it, so, which is quite remarkable, astonishing. Uh. The magnificent frigate bird, magnificent, is literally in their name. They are found in the tropical Atlantic and considered one of the most aerodynamic birds in the sky. Weighing about three pounds, with a wingspan of about seven feet, this bird is incredibly efficient at soaring with very little wind. Mangroves don't have many predators compared to most other habitats. Uh, these birds would be very easily upset by uh, some predators that might be on the the keys that have upland forests. Uh, this is a, a sanctuary to them. Frigate birds may not have any natural predators lurking about, but that doesn't mean there is no threat. Because they can't take flight vertically like some species, they need to be on the edges of the islands close to the water's edge to get lift. So they, they have to be on the edge of the island, and uh, that's what brings them into conflict with boaters. Uh, folks will come here and fish right next to the uh, island, or sometimes they'll moor overnight. Uh, and uh, it puts the birds at a real disadvantage because they have a real tenacity to these sites that they've chosen. In recent years, spoonbill nests have proven susceptible to disturbance from human activity. When humans scare birds off of their nests, the eggs and the young become vulnerable to predation from crows, and for islands closer to shore, by raccoons. Limiting access to the places where birds are nesting increases nesting success rates. A recent downgrade in the wood stork's federal listing from endangered to threatened can largely be attributed to protecting nesting and roosting areas from human impacts. All these birds are here because of something that was set up decades and decades ago in the case of uh, Key West Refuge in 1908. Uh, this was set aside as a refuge, as a sanctuary, and we have to understand that we're just visitors here, but this is where these birds live. This is the, the place that they depend on. There's no other place they can go. We can come out and recreate and enjoy ourselves, and, and, and that's important to, to all of us, but we have to be careful about not disturbing the essence of this place, not uh, taking away the very fiber of what makes this place special, and that's the, the creatures that live here.
In addition to the four national wildlife refuges in the Florida Keys, many of South Florida's treasured mangrove forests are located in areas managed by federal agencies. A patchwork of rules exist in regards to visiting mangrove islands in Biscayne National Park, Everglades National Park, Dry Tortugas National Park, Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, and National Wildlife Refuges. These rules are meant to protect the nesting and roosting habitats of our resident and migrating birds. There are also many no-wake zones enforced near mangroves, implemented to protect against erosion. If you are not familiar with the specific rules regulating a certain mangrove island, the best approach is no approach at all. Admire from a distance. Disturbance is an issue. It's not intentional, it's mostly inadvertent, but um, we just need to give the birds a little bit of space around the island, something that, just enough room that they'll feel comfortable um, and, and not be disturbed and not depart and not uh, suffer the consequences of, uh, say for a nesting bird, of exposing its young to predation or the hot rays of the sun um, or missing the feedings of the uh, young because they're not there to feed them. It's thought that during the, the plume hunting era that the biggest thing that, that really reduced the number of birds was not the actual hunting and killing, but the disturbance during the nesting season is that the birds just simply quit raising young because the guns were going off all the time. Um, now, I don't know that that is, we will never know whether that's exactly true, but that is a hypothesis that's been thrown out by, by some highly respected ornithologists. So the bottom line is that these islands are off limits uh, to everybody um, and for the protection of these wading bird species. Research shows that roughly 35% of the world's mangrove forests have been lost in the past 20 years. In Florida, humans have caused the loss of 86% of the mangroves since the 1940s. While there are certainly natural causes such as hurricanes that account for the loss of some mangrove forests, the main cause has been urban, industrial, and agricultural shoreline development. Because of the high cost of waterfront property, much of the mangrove forests that fringed the Florida coastline were removed and replaced with concrete and steel. In addition, dredging activities undertaken to create residential canals, marinas, and ports ripped many mangrove forests from their roots. And this mass removal of mangrove habitat likely affected the water quality around Florida. Another uh, service that these mangrove forests provide is improving the water quality. So how do they improve the water quality? Well, if you have a lot of um, sediment or um, particulates that are in the water column, these are all being washed out towards the ocean uh, from the land surface. and if those materials get out into the seagrasses and the seagrass beds and um, other types of marine environments, they can um, you know, create problems in that environment. And so the mangrove roots actually act as traps and they slow the water down and collect that sediment and improves the water clarity. And so that improves the seagrass beds, the fisheries, um, a whole host of uh, ecosystem um, uh, activities that um, in the near coastal ocean. When the seagrass beds and coral reef habitat are subjected to a water column with too much suspended sediment, then the sunlight reaching the seafloor is reduced, which interferes with photosynthesis. Mangrove roots trap and hold unstable soil and drifting sediment. This alone makes mangrove swamps valuable for the overall health of the ecosystem. Additional benefits are achieved by resident filter feeders, like sponges and oysters, which live attached to the roots and continually filter the water, removing nutrients that can cause algae blooms. And while water clarity and algae blooms may not be a top concern for the average citizen, there is a more personal reason to protect mangrove habitat, something a little closer to home. Yes, mangroves provide a number of services besides uh, habitat for wildlife. Uh, one uh, feature that they provide is protection against storms and high winds. So not only if you have high winds near um, residential areas, it will uh, decrease those wind speeds and then also the tidal surge 
Mangroves are very effective in their roots at absorbing the energy from that tidal surge and from the wave action. When mangroves are subjected to a hurricane, especially winds above 100 miles per hour, the leaves are stripped, the roots are suffocated, and the damage can look like a tangle of broken branches. The high winds and surging seas that pummel the mangroves means protection for waterfront homes and businesses because these forests act as a buffer. And because of the intricate root systems of the red mangrove trees in particular, many trees stay put even if they are stripped of leaves during the storm. This mangrove barrier also reduces erosion of sediments on the coast. The severity of the constant abrasion of the water is abated when tidal action is mellowed by the mangroves. Of course, as the mangrove islands buffer and filter the surrounding waters, they collect more than just sediment and surge. Mangroves collect trash. I mean, they, the, the prop roots and such really just, things come in and they never go back out unless we carry them. They, uh, you go along some of these mangrove shorelines and, and the funny thing is, one of the most common things you see in the, in, along the mainline keys is light bulbs. Just incandescent light bulbs. Um, they just seem to last forever. So, um, yeah, it's, a lot of these shorelines are just covered in trash. Just stuff that people bring out and don't take back with them. Um, it's really, really quite upsetting. In 1996, the Florida legislature recognized the ecological importance of mangroves when they enacted the Mangrove Trimming and Preservation Act. At the time, there were an estimated 555,000 acres of mangroves in Florida. The law regulates the trimming and alteration of mangroves statewide. If you are a homeowner and you have encroaching mangroves, the best thing you can do for the mangrove is to let it grow without trimming. If you do feel that your mangroves need trimming, Hire a professional who knows the rules. Mangroves can successfully be planted in suitable areas, and a restoration program in Key Largo proved this back in 2001. At the Carey's Fort Yacht Club, 30 acres of mangrove habitat was restored, and within five years became indistinguishable from other natural mangrove habitat. With the mangroves, so come the fish, and with the fish come the anglers, and the anglers help support the economy. The number of benefits resulting from healthy mangrove forests is seemingly endless. Recreation, economic engine from visitors fishing and sightseeing, nursery for economically important commercial fish species, nesting and roosting habitat for birds, protection from hurricanes and tidal surge, reduced coastal erosion, a sediment trap for improving water quality, habitat for filter feeders, and mangroves also provide very important habitat for the federally threatened American crocodile and other imperiled species. But there is one more characteristic of mangrove forests that make them essential in our attempts to protect our veritable Garden of Eden here on Earth. Similar to other plants, mangroves absorb carbon dioxide from the air where they photosynthesize. This carbon gets locked in as it's utilized by the tree to produce more leaves. This is why plant communities like grasslands, rainforests, and mangroves are called carbon sinks. Researchers at the National Park Service's South Florida Natural Resource Center have found that mangrove forests have two to three times the carbon trapping ability of other types of forests, making them an important player in reducing greenhouse gases and slowing global climate change. But global climate change will be accompanied by rising sea levels, which could greatly jeopardize the future of Florida's mangrove forests. The rate of sea level rise will likely exceed the rate at which these mangrove forests can colonize upslope and upland areas are sometimes concrete seawalls. One more reason for government representatives and resource managers to plan and take steps to adapt to the effects of global climate change. So a case can be made that mangroves are an essential component to our natural world here in South Florida and throughout the world, and that it is likely a good idea to protect the mangrove forests that remain, and maybe even plant some new trees to restore lost mangrove habitat. But don't take our word for it. Book a trip. 
take a ride, find a way. Visit these mangrove forests and be transported to the deep country, a place where very few venture, but all who make it marvel at the magnificence of the mangroves.